Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Ken Raggio Live. I welcome you into this program tonight. For the next hour, we're going to be talking about a lot of things pertaining to Bible prophecies. Uh, first thing off, would you please click like on your timeline there and let me know you're here. If you will make a comment, let me know what city, state, and country you're watching from. And share this with your friends, please. If you're not already following me on Facebook, I invite you to do that. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the notification bell so that you will receive a notice whenever we post a new video. My subject tonight has to do with the Sixth Trumpet War. The news tells us that Turkey is preparing war in Syria and Iran is boosting Hamas in Gaza and in Syria. Could it be the Sixth Trumpet War? Turkey preps war in Syria and Iran boosts Hamas in Gaza and in Syria. If you're a student of Bible prophecy, then you probably know by now that the Sixth Trumpet War found in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation is one of the most significant events of the last days leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. As best we can tell, the Sixth Trumpet War is the equivalent of World War III because the Bible tells us there's going to be a great war along the Euphrates River and it's going to kill one-third of mankind. This is a massive war the likes of which we've never even heard of. It's never even uh, really been imagined other than these Bible prophecies and so this is a big deal. So when we see developments in eastern Syria along the Euphrates River these have so much significance. Now it's not only the events that we see in Syria along the Euphrates that g gives us pause because if you're a student of Bible prophecy as I am then you know there are so many events all over the world today that are taking place that give us reason to believe that we are indeed living in the last days. Jesus told us that there would be one generation, in the book of Matthew 24, he tells us that there would be one generation in which all the prophetic signs pertaining to the last days would come to pass in that last generation. And now we're in that generation. We've seen the biggest part of those prophecies take place. We've seen the wars and rumors of wars. We've seen the earthquakes in divers places. We've seen the signs in the heavens. We've seen the spiritual decline that he prophesied, the great spiritual deceptions that have come upon Christianity in these last days. And, and all of the Middle East events have played perfectly into the uh, scenarios that are depicted by the scriptures and the prophets of the scriptures. And so we know now that we are getting closer and closer to the end of our age, the end of our generation, the end of that, that last generation. And so it's very important that we keep our eyes closely on the headline news so that we'll know and understand exactly what time it is and how close we are to the second coming of Jesus. Now, we know there's seven years that have to be fulfilled prophetically that lead up to the great and final battle of Armageddon. Those seven years will begin when the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church confirms a covenant with many for one week. And so we're looking for the Pope of the Catholic Church to sign off on some kind of a Middle East peace program. We don't know exactly what the details of that will be, but I'm sure that it will be significant enough that real Bible lovers, students of the Bible, will be able to know and easily recognize that what we're witnessing is that prophesied event. And that will trigger the last seven years. And in the middle of that seven years, 42 months later, there's going to be a huge event take place in Jerusalem in the newly built third temple. Now, the temple is not there yet, but it's, it's, it's getting closer and closer to the day when that temple will be built. I just posted a video this week on my Facebook timeline that was uh, published by the Temple Institute in Jerusalem in which they call for the building of the third temple. Now, this is not certainly not the first video they've done on this subject, but we do know that the, the uh, mindset is growing. There are more and more Jews in Israel that now are in favor of the construction of the third temple, and that is so significant because the Bible tells us that there's going to be a man of sin that's going to come into that third temple, and he's going to commit what Daniel called in Daniel 9.27, the abomination that maketh desolate. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, 
15, when you see that man of sin commit that abomination, he said, when you therefore shall see the abomination spoken by the prophet Daniel stand in the holy place, then let the which be in Judea flee to the mountains, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor shall ever be. So Jesus warned us that when we see the man of sin, that Assyrian man of sin that's mentioned in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 24 to 27, and in Micah chapter 5, verse 5, this Assyrian Muslim man of sin is going to come into the temple and render it desolate because of abominations. That's going to trigger the last three and a half years, the last 42 months, the last 1260 days of great tribulation, both on Israel and on all the world, including the end time church. Now, during that last 42 months, we have this one big event. Now, there's a lot of big events. Uh, one of the big events is the mark of the beast being introduced at that time, because at the same time, the man of sin commits that uh, abomination in the temple. We also know that Jerusalem is going to be accomplished about by armies. Jesus said that in Luke 21, 20. And so Jerusalem is going to be rendered under siege and left desolate ultimately during that 42 months. And according to Revelation chapter 7, we know that 144,000 Jews are going to be sealed by God and protected during the Great Tribulation, whereas Zechariah 13, 7, and 8 tells us that two-thirds of Israel is going to die and one-third are going to be tried in the fire like gold and silver is tried in the fire. So this is a great, great calamity. Daniel used terms like desolations, consummations, and uh, abominations for that period of time. And then according to Revelation chapter 7 and those 144,000 Jews being sealed. Immediately after those 144,000 Jews are sealed in the middle of the week, then we know that the four spirits that are called the four horsemen in, in Zechariah 6 and in Revelation 6, those four spirits are going to be loosed to hurt the earth and to hurt the seas. And they're going to be loosed in the area of the river Euphrates. So Bible students have been watching keenly for a long, long time to see if and when and how this Euphrates River War is going to be developing. And so I have big news for you tonight to tell you that there is right now a major international war developing in eastern Syria in the region of the Euphrates River. I'm reading an article from today's Breitbart, or this, this is August the 5th, an article by Edwin Mora in Breitbart, and the t title of the article is Erdogan, speaking of uh, Turkey's president Recep Tayyip Erdogan, says Turkey plans to attack U.S. allied Kurds in Syria. I want you to get this. Turkey plans to attack U.S. allied Kurds in Syria. Turkey has renewed plans to launch a military operation against the U.S. allied Kurdish fighters who helped the United States defeat the Islamic State's territorial caliphate, the Turkish president announced over the weekend. Now, those of you that keep up with the news will remember that we're only about two years removed from a war in Syria where the United States went in there to defeat ISIS, and it's only been the last few months that President Trump has announced that the ISIS caliphate has been defeated <coughs> and has been overthrown. But now we discover, according to this week's news, that ISIS is about to make a comeback in eastern Syria, and it's making a comeback under the sponsorship of Turkey. This announcement came as news reports surface that Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is supplying weapons to Al-Qaeda-linked jihadis working with Ankara-allied rebels to prevent an onslaught by forces loyal to dictator Bashar al-Assad backed by Russian airstrikes. Now let me summarize this, quick, this statement quickly, and that is the fact that Turkey now is lining up with Al-Qaeda and ISIS operatives against Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, and against Russia. This is crazy, folks. This man in Turkey wants to take over that northeastern part of Syria, and he wants to drive the Kurds out of there. Now, I, it's very difficult for me not to make a comment about something that's very personal to me in this regard, and that is that several years ago, 
in the process of building my website at kenradgel.com, I had built several pages that were uh, basically clickbait. I was trying to build a page for every nation of the world, trying to generate traffic for people who are interested in, in reading about the gospel. And so I built a web page for every nation on earth, nearly, about a hundred nations. I built a web page for each nation, and I included, I felt impressed, and this has been maybe eight or ten years ago, I felt impressed to build a web page for Kurdistan. Now, I knew that Kurdistan is not a, an official nation. And I honestly didn't know hardly anything at all about Kurdistan 10 years ago. But I felt like it was important for me to do that. And surely enough, in the last 8 or 10 years, I've had a lot of traffic come from the region of Kurdistan. Now, what we call Kurdistan is actually part of uh, southeastern Turkey, part of eastern Syria, part of northwestern Iraq, and northwestern Iran. So that whole border region there between Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, that's what most people call Kurdistan because the Kurds live in that area. And in many cases, in most cases, the Kurds are peace-loving people. And in this last war in Syria, the Kurds actually became allies to the United States in trying to bring about peace in eastern Syria. Now anybody that follows the Muslim conflicts in the Middle East, for one thing they probably got a headache because it is exceedingly complicated, exceedingly complex, and when you try to keep up with who is doing what in the Middle East, it's, it's difficult not to lose track because uh, for the most part the Turks are allied with the Muslim Brotherhood. They are Sunni Muslims and they are uh, they are radicals in most cases. At least I would say that uh, President Erdogan is is a radical-leaning president there. He is a dictator. He's got many years left on his tenure as the president of Turkey, and he is, he is in, on many counts, an extremist. We also know that Bashar al-Assad in Syria is, uh, is an Alawi. He is pretty much allied with the Shias, of Iran. In fact, since the civil war broke out eight or nine years ago in Syria, Iran has played the biggest support role in coming in there and helping out uh, Bashar al-Assad. And so the war between Turkey and Iran actually was a, a reality back in those days. Iran was supporting Hezbollah, and uh, yet the Sunnis were supporting ISIS and al-Qaeda. Turkey has been supporting ISIS. Turkey has been supporting Al-Qaeda. And Iran has been supporting Hezbollah. Iran's got its own operatives in there, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and, and Hezbollah. And now, in one of the headlines I'm going to show you in a moment, is that Iran is bringing Hamas into that territory. And so we've got a major conflict building. And then, of course, there's another major power there, and that's Russia. Russia has been there now for almost 10 years supporting Bashar al-Assad. And then the United States is there in eastern Syria and has been trying to keep the peace and trying to drive ISIS out of there. Now, it's extremely complicated. It takes much more than an hour-long program for me to try to sort through all the difficulties of explaining who's against who in that region of the world. But I can tell you this, that ISIS, although it was recently defeated by the U.S. forces in that part of the world, ISIS is about to make a comeback. Now, the Assad regime had struggled to clear the area of jihadis, a move that would allow the regime to consolidate its control of most of Syria, with the exception of the land in northern Syria controlled by U.S.-backed People's Protection Units, called the YPG. The YPG fighters are the armed wing of the Democratic Union Party that controls most of northern Syria. So the Kurds control most of that area up against the Turkish border. But on Sunday, President Erdogan noted that it has shared Turkey's plan to carry out an offensive against those Kurds in northern Syria with Russia and the United States. So the Turkey is getting ready to make war with Russia and the United States pertaining to the Kurds in northern Syria. He said, we entered Afrin, Jerabulus, and Al-Bab in northern Syria, and now we're going to enter east of the Euphrates, home to the territory controlled by the YPG, Erdogan said Sunday. 
He was referring to the successful operations against the Syrian Kurds and to a lesser extent ISIS since 2016 under Operation Euphrates Shield and Olive Branch. Ankara has long considered the YPG Kurds to be an extension of the Kurd Kurdistan Workers' Party, or the PKK, which is a United States and Turkey-designated terrorist group that's been waging a decades-long insurgency on Turkish soil. Now, that's why Turkey hates them, is because the Kurds have moved into Turkey. But the political wing of the U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic Forces, which is the SDF, a Kurdish Arab alliance primarily comprised of and led by the YPG, denies any link to the PKK. For months, listen carefully, Turkey has cautioned about a looming campaign against the Kurds in northern Syria. I feel like we need to prepare ourselves for the reality that this issue of the Kurds and the potential of a future Kurdistan could very well be one of the real triggers of the Sixth Trumpet War. This whole fight and squabble between the Sunnis and the Shias and the Kurds could be the reason why Russia and the United States get involved in one of the biggest, nastiest wars of all time. Now, I read one commentator just yesterday who commented that even if Israel was not even in the region, if there was no state of Israel, there's enough animosity and hostility between the Muslims themselves to bring about a world war. It's not as if Israel is the sole culprit in all the trouble in the Middle East, because it's absolutely not. Because the Muslims war among themselves. That fact is... Uh, alluded to in the ancient prophecies of the Bible because the Bible said that the sons of Ishmael or Ishmael would be a wild man and his hand would be against every man. So when we see the Muslims fighting with each other, it's simply fulfilling the prophecies pertaining to the sons of Ishmael in the Bible. So despite all the concerns, the United States continues to support the Kurdish fighters as the most effective force against ISIS. Now here's the deal. You're going to have the United States and the Kurds fighting with Turkey and ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And ultimately, Syria and Russia is going to get dragged into this thing. And it looks like, for the time being, uh, we, we can't really predict how Russia and Syria is going to play in that, in that war. But whatever it is, the Sixth Trumpet War, according to the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation, is going to be a terrible war right there on the Euphrates River. In January of 2018, President Donald Trump warned Turkey not to carry out operations against the American allied YPG, Kurds. For several months, Turkey has threatened to attack the Syrian Kurds, arguing that they're gaining too much clout near the Turkish border where they can provide support to the PKK in Turkey. The Al-Qaeda-linked jihadis are the last group with control of substantial territory in Syria that experts from the American Enterprise Institute believe can be used to establish an Islamic emirate. Al-Qaeda-linked jihadis and Turkish-backed rebels, including ISIS, control most of the area in and around Idlib. Some reports suggest that Turkey which was supposed to be responsible for pushing the jihadis out of the region, is actually arming al-Qaeda against the Syrian dictator. Now, let me just come on this fact. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If you really knew what was in the heart and mind of Recep Erdogan, you would understand that this guy is no friend of the Syrians. Ultimately, he wants to have a global Islamic caliphate. And it's obvious that Bashar al-Assad is not subservient to Recep Erdogan. Assad is more allied with the Russians and the Iranians, and he is no friend of the Turks. And that makes Bashar al-Assad an enemy of Erdogan. And that means that Erdogan has motivation to destroy 
Assad and to destroy Iran and to come into Syria and make an effort to take Syria. And you know if he does, he's going to begin in northeastern Syria. He's already called for a 20-mile wide buffer zone along the border, and he's already effectively declared war against the Kurds in that reason. And he's, he is reportedly right now supporting a resurgence of ISIS in that region. Now, in another article from Breitbart dated August the 3rd, which is just a few days ago, this UN report tells us that the Islamic State, listen carefully, the Islamic State is planting sleeper cells in preparation for eventual resurgence. The Islamic State, now the ISIS is what Donald Trump just boasted about us defeating but now the United Nations is telling us that ISIS is getting ready to make a comeback. The Islamic State terror group continues to pose a real and present danger, according to the latest United Nations six-month report on jihadist activities. ISIS leadership aims to adapt, survive, and consolidate in the core area and to establish sleeper cells at the local level in preparation for eventual resurgence while using propaganda to maintain the group's reputation as the leading global terrorist brand, the virtual caliphate. Now, here's the reason why ISIS and Erdogan get along, because they both want to see an Islamic caliphate. Erdogan is motivated to support ISIS, and ISIS is motivated to work with Erdogan because they both want to control the world for Islam. When it has the time and space to reinvest in an external operation capability, ISIS will direct and facilitate international attacks in addition to the ISIL-inspired attacks that continue to occur in many locations around the world. So ISIS is not dead. It's not going away. It's still causing trouble all over the world. The current abatement of such attacks may not last long, possibly not even until the end of 2019, the United Nations warned. The report points to the estimated 30,000 foreigners who traveled to fight for ISIS and may still be alive. Their future prospects will be of international concerns for the foreseeable future, the report says. Some may join al-Qaeda or other terrorist brands that may emerge. Some will become leaders or radicalizers. Despite a drop in recent major attacks, the threat to Europe from the Islamic State activity remains high, the report declares. Deradicalization programs have not proven to be fully effective, the report said. The most combat-hardened fighters serving longer sentences are not yet approaching release from prison, but they remain dangerous and continue to pose a challenge both inside and outside of the prisons. As many as 6,000 European citizens traveled to Iraq and Syria to join ISIS and other radical groups, the document notes. While a third was killed, another third remains at large, and 2,000 or more may have returned to Europe. The report also notes that the Islamic State still has access to somewhere between 50 and $300 million remaining from the re revenues of the caliphate. Those $300 million could be used to inflict great damage. ISIS is making a comeback. And here's a third article on this subject from Breitbart e, uh, on August the 4th. This article is by Aaron Klein. Now, I've used a lot of Aaron Klein's material because he's very much in the know about what's happening. And he says, according to defense sources, Turkey is aiding Islamic State resurgence after Trump devastated their caliphate. Let me read you that headline again. Defense sources say, Turkey is aiding Islamic State resurgence after Trump devastated caliphate. You stop and think about this. The United States tr destroyed ISIS out of Syria. We intended to put ISIS to silence, but we haven't because now Turkey is calling them back. Turkey is supporting them. They've still got hundreds of millions of dollars at their disposal, and they're still active underground. They're still preparing to make a comeback. Turkey has been working to bring thousands of Islamic State fighters to the region to launch campaigns in Iraq and Kurdish regions along the Syria-Iraq border, according to informed Middle Eastern defense officials. The officials finger Turkish intelligence and military personnel as helping 
to facilitate the resurgence of ISIS to essentially work as proxies to attack Kurdish positions and pressure the West and regional actors into supporting Turkish interests in Syria. The alleged Turkish support for ISIS comes as Russia, Iran, and Turkey held a series of trilateral meetings in recent weeks. Now here's, here's the catch. According to this latest meeting between Russia, Turkey, and Iran, they have all agreed that they are opposed to the Kurds in eastern Syria, and that's where their common denominator is. They all want to get the Kurds out of there. The statement announced that Russia, Turkey, and Iran rejected all attempts to create new rallies, realities on the ground under the pretext of combating terrorism. They're fighting against the Kurds. Last week, a panel of United Nations experts reported to the United Nations Security Council there is evidence that ISIS is seeking to bring about an eventual resurgence in its Iraqi and Syrian heartlands. The panel of experts said in a report to the Security Council this week that the process is more advanced in Iraq where ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and most of the militant group's leadership are now based following the fall of the so-called caliphate that he declared in the two neighboring countries. The UN report did not mention Turkey's alleged role in aiding ISIS. Now, doesn't that figure? Because the United Nations is pro-Muslim anyway, and so they're not going to tell us what's really behind all this. Now, I've talked about Turkey and ISIS, but there's another big factor, and that is Iran and Hamas. Now, if you follow me any period of time, you've heard me talk about how that Iran has supported a major, major presence of Hezbollah in both, uh, both uh, Syria and in Lebanon. Hezbollah is all over Lebanon and just about totally controls Lebanon, and Hezbollah has a major presence in Syria, as well as our Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, has a big presence in Syria, and they're increasing their presence. But now this article tells us that Iran is, is, is escalating its support for Hamas. Now, Hamas is the terror organization that we know predominantly down in the Gaza Strip on the south of Israel. This article dated August the 7th, which is yesterday, by Deborah Dannon in Breitbart says, Iran is said to increase Hamas funding to $30 million per month in exchange for intelligence on Israel. Iran has agreed to raise its monthly payments to Palestinian terror group Hamas to $30 million a month in exchange for intelligence on Israeli missile stockpiles according to Israel's Channel 12 News. In a meeting last month in Tehran, between a delegation of senior Hamas officials and Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Hamas also requested help from Tehran to get closer, get, cl to the, get closer to the Syrian regime after ties were cut during the country's civil war. So Iran and Hamas are working together with millions and millions of dollars every month to strengthen Hamas's relationship with Syria. So Hamas is going to side with Assad and presumably Russia ultimately and Turkey and Al-Qaeda and ISIS are going to be against them. And you know that Russia is going to escalate in that matter and you know the United States is going to have to intervene or else there's going to be a major, major problem. Separately, on Monday, Iranian diplomat Amr Musawi said that Tehran and its terror proxy Hezbollah had facilitated what he called the first steps in implementing a Hamas return to Syria. A Hamas return to Syria. I just told you Turkey is going to bring ISIS back to Syria, and now Iran is going to bring Hamas back to Syria. It's getting worse and worse by the day in Syria, and a bigger and a bigger war is imminent. It is, it's inevitable. Noting that Hamas has weight and prestige, Musawi said that restoring relations between the terror group and Damascus was crucial in the fight against Israel, as well as any potential conflict between Iran and the United States. So they're putting, they're bringing Hamas into Syria to fight the United States, bringing Hamas into Syria to fight Turkey, bringing Hamas into Syria to fight the Kurds. 
War, 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 more war, more war, more war, and it's all Islamic fomented. The Turks against the Iranians, Hezbollah against Hamas, which ultimately brings Russia against the United States because Russia is a guard to them, and that's a prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 7, where the Bible tells us that speaking of Gomer to Garma, which is modern Turkey, and speaking of Persia, which is modern Iran, that Gog and Magog, which is Russia, is going to be a guard to them. So the prophecy tells us that Russia is going to be a guard to Turkey and Iran. Russia is going to be a guard to the Muslims, basically. And it looks like the United States is going to be on the opposing side of that war. And that's that's ultimately going to be the Sixth Trumpet War. It's all building up. Separately on Monday, Iranian diplomat Amir al Musawi said that Tehran and its terror proxy Hezbollah had facilitated these first steps to Im- implement a Hamas return to Syria. Musawi also added that Hamas was ready for any confrontation with the Zionist entity if war were to break out between Israel and Iran and the U.S. Six Trumpet War. Six Trumpet War. Now, Hamas is no small entity. Hamas wrestled the Gaza Strip away from Fatah, which is the Palestinian Authority's government. We know back in the days of the PLO and Yasser Arafat, Fatah uh, took over the West Bank and has been ruling the Palestinian Authority from uh, Ramallah. And uh, Hamas was a minor terrorist organization back in those days, and Fatah ruled both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. But Hamas came in there and wrestled away from Fatah, and so Hamas has been ruling the Gaza Strip, and so we've had an enormous amount of trouble. Israel has had hundreds and hundreds of missiles fired across the borders. The the radicals down there have set their uh, agricultural fields on fire by the tens of thousands of hectares and they've destroyed crops by the millions and millions of dollars worth and they've done everything they can to terrorize southern Israel but Israel says in this article and I'm reading uh, by Deborah Dannon August the 3rd in Breitbart it says IDF tells us the Israeli defense force tells us that the next Gaza war is going to be short but it's going to deal a massive blow to Hamas They said the next war with Hamas in the Gaza Strip will be shorter but harsher than the 2014 Operation Protective Edge and will deal a massive blow to terror groups in the coastal enclave. Now be that as it may, you should be able to guess that if the United States deals Hamas a major blow in Gaza that is going to exacerbate the tensions between Iran and Israel because Iran backs Hamas and if Hamas takes a whipping it's going to make Iran all the matter and make them want to fight against Israel and we've talked about this so many times both Iran and Turkey have their own animosities against Israel Iran's animosity against Israel is somewhat different from Turkey's animosity toward Israel Iran Uh, in a nutshell, wants to wipe Israel off the map and and obliterate it, whereas Turkey seeks more of a political dominion over Israel. uh, I have not heard uh, Erdogan say so much about specifically wiping Israel off the map as his his, his rhetoric has gone, been more to the effect that uh, he supports the Palestinians in their, uh, in their taking over the West Bank, and he supports the Gazas. He basically supports the uh, Islamic uh, governments there. He says he wants to take East Jerusalem for the Muslims. And so Erdogan has, m- for the most part, been supportive of an Islamic uh, government in the West Bank and Gaza and in East Jerusalem, whereas uh, Iran wants to just totally destroy Israel. But you also have to realize that in the back of Erdogan's mind is to build a global Islamic caliphate, which ultimately will take all of Israel. So uh, at, at best, Erdogan is just taking somewhat of a softer approach 
than Iran is. But meanwhile, they're both murderers. Both of them are, are genocidal toward Israel. It's, it, it's impossible not to come to the conclusion that Iran is genocidal toward Israel and that Turkey is genocidal toward Israel because it's a fact. And all the news reports show that. And I have an article here from Debka Files today, August the 8th. It says, Iran brings drones to two redeployments near the Syrian-Israeli border. The Bible, uh, the, this article tells us that uh, they have moved uh, weapons into Aldemus, 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 which is near the Syrian-Lebanon border after the Revolutionary Guard's Al-Qaeda brigades obtained permission of the Syrian ruler Bashar al-Assad. It's located west of Damascus and 40 kilometers from the Israeli border opposite the IDF's Mount Hermon positions. Now, I'm not reading this whole article, but Iran has been moving weapons just northwest of Kunitra. Now, Kunitra is exactly on the border of Israel. I, usually, I take my tour groups over there every year in October, November, and we, we usually go up into the United Nations uh, lookout compound there in the top of the mountain, and we look over into Kenitra, Syria. There's been, over the past years, there's been ISIS strong, strongholds there. There was a time when ISIS actually took over the United Nations compound there for, for a while, and uh, finally the Allies pushed them back and freed Kenitra. Kenitra has basically been a ghost town for the last few years, and the United Nations compound was retaken, and it's back under UN control. But now this article tells us that that the Iranian terrorists have moved in new equipment just northwest of Kenitra. They're right on the Israeli border, Iran. And an article I read just last week says that Iran has declared that we are at Israel's border. Now, so much for the news. Let me talk about some Bible prophecies for a minute. Now, folks, why do I even bother with all this subject? because we're living in the last days. The Bible is God Almighty's eternal, infallible word. The prophecies of this Bible are forever true, and every prophecy in this Bible, if it has not already come to pass with precision, it will yet come to pass with great, perfect precision. And that's why I tell you about these things, because the Bible tells us that this generation is going to end with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I personally know a lot of Christians who are in doubt, professing Christians, who doubt that Jesus Christ will come in their lifetimes, and I think that's a very foolish, uh, that's a very foolish conclusion because Jesus told us that all these prophecies will be fulfilled in one generation, and he gave for a particular reference the budding of the fig tree, or the, he said, when you see the fig tree put on new leaves, new leaves, you know that summer is now. Likewise, when you see all these prophecies begin to come to pass, know that this generation will not pass away till all these signs be fulfilled. And so the putting on, the fig, the, the putting on of new leaves on the fig tree is, is a parallel to the state of Israel because in the Old Testament, Israel is compared to figs and fig trees. And so we saw the fig tree put on new leaves in May of 1948 when the nation came back from dispersion when it came back from Diaspora and became a new state in May, on May the 14th of 1948, and that triggered the last generation. It's been 71 years since the fig tree put on new leaves. We're in the 71st year of the last generation. That's why I never stop preaching these things. It's too late for me to quit preaching. It's too late for me to be making excuses and putting off and saying, well, it's not going to happen in our time. It is going to happen in our times. If this Bible is true, you and I are going to see the coming of Jesus Christ, and I believe that it is. And I've quoted again and again and again from Psalms chapter 90, verse 10, where the prophet said, the days of our years are threescore and ten years. That's 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they be fourscore, which is 80 years. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow. So he's telling us that those last 10 years of an old man's life or an old woman's life are typically labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Now you know when you get to 80 years old, you're getting pretty old and you're about wore out. You don't have a lot of time left on this earth for the most part. And it's the same thing in prophecy pertaining 
to the last generation. You know we are approaching that 80th year of the last generation. You have to know that all these prophecies are about to wrap up. So we're in the 71st year of an 80-year generation, and we have seven years left to be fulfilled. We know that it has to be imminent that we see the Pope confirm that covenant. It must be imminent that we will be entering into the last seven years. I don't know if it'll be tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. I can't, I can't answer that question because I don't know. But I believe it is closer, it is sooner than any of us can even begin to imagine. We're going to see all these prophecies finalized and we're going to see that Assyrian Muslim man of sin in Jerusalem. And from all the accounts that I can take right now, if it happens in the next few years, then it's probably going to be this guy, Recep Erdogan. Now, theoretically, there could, this could go on for much more longer. I don't know how it could. But unless something drastically changes, unless we see some unexpected changing of the guards, then it looks like this man... Recep Erdogan holds a very high potential of being the prophesied Assyrian that the prophet said God Almighty is going to send Christ to destroy him. Isaiah 14, 24 says, God said, this is the purpose that I've purposed on the whole earth that I will destroy the Assyrian in my holy mountain. And in Micah chapter 5, the first two verses tell us how that uh, Messiah was prophesied to be born in Bethlehem, Ephrata. So everybody knows that Jesus was prophesied to be born in Bethlehem, and he was. But then the latter verses says the same man that was born in Bethlehem is going to destroy the Assyrian on the holy mountains of Israel when he comes back. So there's two prophecies that tell us that Jesus is going to destroy an Assyrian man of sin on the, on the holy mountains of Israel, which is the Temple Mount. And that prophecy is correlated with uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, where Jesus is going to destroy the beast and the false prophet on the Temple Mount when he comes. The beast being that little horn of that tent that has just uprooted those other ten horns. Three of those horns are going to fall to a Muslim, which, which suggests to us that Europe is going to be overthrown by Islam. And that is Syrian man of sin and the Pope of the Catholic Church. Those are the two men that will be on the mountain when Jesus comes. The Assyrian man of sin and the Pope are going to meet Jesus Christ at his coming. And, and presumably it's that Assyrian man of sin that is going to coordinate all those Muslim armies that will surround Jerusalem 42 months before Jesus comes. Because in the same day that the man of sin commits the abomination of desolation in the Temple Mount, Jesus said Jerusalem is going to be accomplished with armies. And presumably it's going to be Islamic armies. Those are the ones who want to take Jerusalem. And Russia will be in the background supporting them and being a guard to them. The Catholic Church will be cheering it on because the Catholic Church hates Israel and does not want Israel to have sovereignty over the city of Jerusalem. And all of this leads us ultimately to this sixth trumpet war that I've been describing here. We see every every single prophecy developing before our very eyes. What does that mean? That means you and I are likely to see all these prophecies fulfilled. I expect to see them happen in my lifetime unless some tragedy befalls me. I expect to see the Assyrian man of sin. I expect to see the third temple. I expect to see the mark of the beast in my day. I expect to see the great tribulation. I expect to see God Almighty help me through all that. I have great hope and great expectation that I'm going to see the mighty power of God in that end time scenario. It's going to be great for those of, those of us that have faith in God, those of us that have great expectation and great hope in Jesus Christ. And so the evidence I've given you here today is that we are encroaching upon what John called the sixth trumpet war. All those other five trumpets have already sounded. We're waiting on the sixth trumpet to happen on the Euphrates River. And the seventh trumpet war is the great and final battle of Armageddon. And that's when Jesus Christ will come back to destroy all those armies that have entered into Jerusalem to destroy God's people. And at that time, Jesus is going to save both Israel and his church. And the first resurrection and the rapture of the church is going to take place because Jesus is going to appear in the clouds of glory. And the Bible said the last trumpet will sound 
and the dead in Christ are going to rise from their graves, and we which are alive and remain will be called to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And we're coming with Jesus at the rapture to Jerusalem to watch him defeat the beast and the false prophet and to destroy the armies at Armageddon and to enter into Jerusalem and declare it as his capital for 1,000 years of peace on this planet Earth. I'm planning on being with Jesus Christ at the Battle of Armageddon. I will be there in white robes on a white horse. As a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, I'm looking for that day when I see my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ destroy all his enemies. And Ezekiel chapter 36 tells us that for a thousand years, the country of Israel is going to be like the Garden of Eden. And the Bible said that the church, all of those who are born again, John 3, 3 through 5, Acts 2, 38, those of us who are born again are going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ for 1,000 years of peace on earth. It's going to be great. I'm looking for that day. If you're not born again, then you don't have the kind of hope I'm talking about. If you're not born again, you're not ready to meet God, you're going to be lost forever because when Jesus comes, only those who are born again are going to get up out of their graves. The rest are going to die in sin and be condemned to hell eventually. And so for that reason, I beg you today to consider the reality of all these prophecies. The biggest reason, the sole reason really, why I teach all these prophecies is to attempt to wake you up and make you realize the prophecies of the Bible are true, but not only the prophecies true, but the gospel of the Bible is also true. Just as certainly as all these prophecies are being fulfilled exactly the way the Bible says, so is the plan of salvation being fulfilled. And if you want to be saved for all of eternity, if you want to live forever with Jesus Christ, and at the end of that thousand years, the Bible says that heaven and earth is going to pass away and a new heaven and a new earth is going to appear. And there's a city built four square, that four square city called heaven. And that's where the saints of God will spend eternity in the presence of God in that new world after the material world has dis has disappeared the spirit world will exist forever and we'll dwell with him those of us who have been born again in our day and that's what I urge and encourage you to do I pray in Jesus name that you'll find an apostolic church somewhere this Sunday where you will find an opportunity and a place to repent of your sins and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and that you will receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking other tongues for that is the water birth and the spirit birth water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is the water birth and baptism in the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues is the spirit birth and Jesus said if you're not born of the water and of the spirit you cannot enter into the kingdom of God and that's why I preach it every time I get on camera is to tell you and everyone who will listen to me you must be born again Peter said to them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive this gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and your children your children's children as many as are far off as many as the Lord our God shall call God wants to save you. He wants you to live forever, and that's what I plead with you. Believe the gospel. Obey the gospel. Be born again. Save your, un your eternal soul in Jesus' name. And that's my message to you tonight. Thank you for listening to me. I appreciate you being with me. Thanks for spending this time with me. I hope you'll go to Amazon.com before you leave and visit. Uh, just search on Amazon for books by Ken Raggio. Books by Ken Raggio. You'll see nine books here. They're all apostolic Pentecostal books that I've written. The Daily Bible Companions, uh, Volumes 1 and 2. Volume 1 is the Old Testament Lessons. Volume 2 is New Testament Lessons. I'll take you point by point through the entire Bible, Genesis Revelation. It's a great daily Bible reader. Put one by your favorite chair and one beside your bed at night and read Bible lessons for the rest of your life. Learn all the ways of the Lord. If you're interested in Bible prophecies, get this major book, The Daniel Prophecies. God's plan for the last day, 726 pages, 175 photographs, hundreds and hundreds of footnotes, great research. You'll learn more about Bible prophecies in that one book than any other book you'll find anywhere outside the Bible. And check out all the other books while there. If you want to get all my books, 
I'll save you a substantial amount of money if you want to buy them as a set, Just but you have to order them through me and not through Amazon. There's a link below this video. You can get all nine books for $125, and I pay the shipping. That's only good in the United States. I can't afford that shipping outside the country. But if, you want, if you're in the United States and you'd like to buy this whole set of books for $125, then just use that link down below this video. Also, I take a tour to Israel every year in the month of November. I've got this uh, 2019 tour is all booked up. We've sold out all our rooms and flights, so uh, that, that tour is closed. But we're already booking now for 2020, being November of 2020. And if you're interested in that trip, please uh, contact me, and we'll get you on a preliminary waiting list. Also, I've got a Prophecy uh, Cruise to Alaska coming up next May, May the 2nd through the 9th of 2020. I'll be teaching Bible prophecies by night in, uh, in prophecy classes on board the Norwegian Joy. And then by day, we'll be taking a great va vacation to see all the interesting sites along the Alaskan coast. It's going to be a great, great vacation, a great experience in the Bible as well. And I hope you'll go with me. Check that out at my website, or there's a video there. Please go watch that video of the prophecy cruise uh, on the Norwegian Joy. Also, Please follow me on all my social networks. Click like on uh, this video and subscribe and uh, click the notification bell so that you'll get notices each time we publish a new video to YouTube. Thank you for listening to me tonight. Join me every Monday night, Thursday night, 9 p.m. Central, and I'll see you next time. God bless you.